Welcome in to another edition of the JMU Sports News Podcast. I'm Bennett Conlon, joined by Jack Fitzpatrick. The Dukes have a men's basketball coach. They didn't the last time we were on. They do now. This is big-time stuff. A new basketball hire, a new football hire, all in the course of, uh, what, four months? It's been a whirlwind. Crazy times. Crazy. 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 Crazy, man. <laughs> Absolutely crazy. Just about as crazy as March Madness. DJ Burns. I don't know if you heard they're in the Final Four. <laughs> I did not know. That. I That's thought you were about to do the bet online read. Just I don't have the text. So I just wanted to do like a basic segue for you and then talk about the segue that I did and then pass it over to you. Oh, I mean, it is the last, it's down to the last four teams in March Madness in the NCAA tournament. And Bet Online has been your tournament bracket headquarters the entire time. Now that we're almost down to the finals, we've still got a lot more in store. Whoa. ML- MLB's here, <laughs> and NBA and NHL playoffs are right around the corner. As always, Bet Online is the number one, say it, one source for all of your summer sports wagering. Head to Bet Online today, stay updated on all the action, and remember to use promo code BELIEVE. For a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit, bet online where the game starts. Who do you got? Men's, women's, national champs. Uh, so everyone gets disqualified. Mark Byington comes back just for a one game, one off, and the Dukes play App State. Jamie wins. I would take App in that situation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, in truth, UConn, like, like they're. There's no point in betting against UConn at this at this point in the season. They have just mollywopped their way through the field. Fair. UConn Purdue would be a good one. I'm just excited. I want to see another South Carolina Iowa women's matchup. That'd be darn good. That'd be darn good in the women's side. Caitlin Clark is a baller. Um, yeah. Can I say a, a hot take uh, right at the top of this podcast about yeah. Caitlin Clark? Yeah. I think all of this talk about like, is she the goat of women's basketball is diminishing what we're watching. We, we need to stop. And it's my own fault. Cause I'm watching ESPN, but like yeah. we need to stop with this. Is she the goat? She's a damn good basketball player. Let's all sit back, watch and appreciate the greatness we are seeing. Cause we are likely never going to see something like this in our lifetimes. We don't have to contextualize it and then be like Brianna Stewart or Maya Moore or Caitlin Clark. No, Kate, it's Caitlin Clark for right now. Just enjoy it. It's fun to watch. Great shooter, great score. Great time. Um, you know what else is a great score? Don't know where this segue is going. You can follow up with follow us on everything, all our happening, <laughs> all of our stuff. We we are great scorers. <laughs> I didn't know where I was going with that. JMUSportsNews.com is your headquarters for all JMU sports news, opinions, podcasts. Everything that we're doing is over at JMUSportsNews.com. Daniel Merriman just wrote an awesome kind of three, four mm-hmm. takeaways from the Preston Spradlin introductory press conference. Uh, he foiled the article, the uh, the contract of Preston Spradlin. We broke it down a little bit to say where his what his buyout, more importantly, is kind of incentives that are baked in. He's making $600,000 a year. We'll go into that a little bit more in the podcast as we go through. But uh, everything that you need for JMU Sports News is at jmusportsnews.com. 
That's exactly right. Also, if you're watching on YouTube, you're checking us out on YouTube, give us a like, give us a subscribe. We like those. Yeah. All right, should we get into it? Didn't know where else you were going. And you can also keep up to date with all the transfer portal craziness, which we yeah. also will get into later in this podcast. But you can keep updated with our portal trackers, jamiesportsnews.com. Let's get into it, folks. Drum roll, please. Preston Spradlin is the new JMU head coach. Last name, a little bit tricky. He says you can just call him Coach P. I don't love Coach P, so I might be going with Spradlin. Can I say something? Yeah. Um, his last name's not difficult. It's a, I feel like it's a little weird. I mean, maybe sprawled in. I could like say almost being like sprawl, sprawling, spread, spread. Yeah, like you, maybe. you're, but once you get Spradlin down, like once you say it once, then you're you're pretty much, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not totally sold on Coach P yet. I do <laughs> yeah. like Coach Spradlin. <laughs> so, so we'll figure out exactly how that's going to go moving forward but seems like a really good hire right he comes from moorhead state where he was there i think seven years as like the full time and then an eighth where he was the interim where he took over during kind of a rocky situation the coach got got fired i think he had some um accusations that that weren't great in terms of how he was treating players and handling players um so spradlin takes over when they need stability at moorhead state Brings that. They end up finishing that year decently. They actually lost a lot during his first few years as head coach, right? So you talk about those seven-year stint. First three were kind of meh. The last four, they've been phenomenal. Four straight 20-win seasons, two NCAA tournaments, one NIT appearance. They played really, really good basketball. He's only 37, and he's got you know seven, eight years as a head coach, which is crazy to think about. But he was your age. Yeah, he, he was your age when he started as the Moorhead State head coach. Nuts. Nuts. Spent could, a few. Sorry, could you imagine? Ahead. Could you imagine you, you, Ben Conlon, being a Division I men's basketball coach right now? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could. I would just go out there. We'd just be running full court press. We'd be basically Jim Crutchfield, D2. We're going up and down. Our practices, we don't run. We just do practice. We play basketball. Just <laughs> Sweet, but we would not win Division II national championships like Mr. Crutchfield, a rumored, a reported candidate for the job. But Spradlin, he's so young. He's one that I, I should have had on our original list. And I had him on my Google Doc list that I trimmed down, and he didn't make my cut for whatever reason, which Yikes. I thought he wasn't 37, among other reasons, to, to not include him. But anyway, he's a really good basketball coach, four straight. 20 plus wins, couple NCAA tournament appearances. That seems like a good good coach to bring in. Yeah, and he adapts his style of play uh to his roster that he has at a current time. So you go through he used to play kind of an up tempo type of style in his first few years with Moorhead. They're in like the mid to upper 100s in terms of average possession length according to Ken Palm. These last few years they've been low 300s. So he really adjusts things. And if you look at his overall win-loss record, it's not going to blow you away. It's not going to impress you. It's not going to be like, whoa, they got this awesome dude. But you look at the last four years, what he has done, 20-plus wins in each one of the seasons, two NCAA tournament berths, an NIT run where they took down Clemson a year ago. I, I mean, this dude can coach. This dude is really good. Uh, I was a little hesitant when I first heard his name because I wanted something a little bit splashier. But we'll get into kind of I have a I have a part on the doc on, on our outline, kind of life of a mid-major. And, and I just wanted to talk out my thoughts about what this hiring process was like. But Preston Spradlin, uh, I think a home run type of hire for the Dukes. I, I want to play this quick, about 90 second clip from his opening press conference, uh, breaking down what he thinks his style of play is and how he adapts to it each season. The last three years, not counting this past season. We had defended a certain way, right? We had switched one through four. Our ball screen defense was top 20 in the nation, and uh, we were hedging, and we had a very elaborate ball screen defense. We were a scramble team and all these different things. And so going into this past season, we were implementing the defense that had obviously been very good to us. Um, and so we put it in all summer, and then we got to where we, we had a chance to do a close scrimmage against another team, and they beat our brains in. And it was very quickly. It was on a Friday night. I realized, man, we're going to have to change what we're doing with this team. It doesn't matter 
you know, what I like or what's been good. You know, we can't just sit back and say, hey, you guys can't do the defense that I know. I got to learn something new. And um, that was – so 10 days after that, we opened at Alabama. And uh, so in that 10-day span, we completely changed our defense, ball screen coverage, um, our switching, uh, how we got through screens. And so we had to, as a staff, put our heads together, put a plan together of how we were going to break the habits we had built for three and a half months and then instill some new habits, some very particular ones that were going to help this team in the long run, knowing that it might not help us in the first two weeks. But that's, you know, it's, it's a marathon. And so we completely changed all of that. But what doesn't change in terms of our defense, you know, schematically, those things may change. Our standards do not. We like that. You ready to run through a brick wall? I like that he uh, can adapt to different things, right? Where if something's not working, there are some coaches who are incredibly stubborn and they'll keep going with it. Doesn't seem like that's him. Yeah. I also think he's a great communicator which I think will help him as a coach, the way he describes uh, things they want to do as a team. He's very clear about the values of the program, right? I don't think they're offering crazy NIL deals. and We'll get into that. <laughs> we'll get to get to that later. But yeah, he seems like a really solid communicator. He seems like somebody who's very grounded. He strikes me as somebody who's kind of wise beyond his years. He doesn't seem like a 37-year-old coach. No, not at all. It, it might be because he has seven years of head coaching experience now. It's not often you get a 37-year-old head coach who started his head coaching career at the ripe old age of 29. Like that, that is just so young to me. It's something that is honestly unheard of across the Division One landscape. But he may change. He may adapt. He changes things based on how his roster is handling it. The one thing that doesn't change with Preston Spradlin and his Moorhead State teams Man, did they defend the heck out of the ball. They have been one of the top defensive teams in the OVC every single year that he's been there. He just preaches a high-end defensive style team. Offense changes a little bit. He was talking to a little bit about of a, how at one point they had a, you know, a 6'10 type of guy who then transferred to Auburn and became an All-American. And he said every possession we were getting him the ball. After he transferred their, ne- their next season, their best player was Mark Freeman, who's in the transfer portal, who was a 5'10", 5'11 guard. And you can only imagine how different, an o- how different an offense might look when you're running things through a 6'10 forward to then a 5'10 guard. So he, he can keep things very, very loose and can really adjust to his roster. And I'm very excited to see that because he's going to have to completely revamp this Duke's roster. And it's different. He does it differently than Byington, right? So they play slower offensively, like you had mentioned. Defensively, they're not known for forcing a lot of turnovers, so they defend really well without creating turnovers, which is JMU's thing previously under Byington, which is force a bunch of turnovers and go in transition. So very different style, but one that's proven to be successful. You mentioned some of the numbers aren't crazy. 52-6 and at home over the last four years, which I thought was impressive. In this year, they were 29, or sorry, 26 and four against non power conference teams. So they had five of their nine losses were to power conference teams, four of those actually Big Ten teams, and then Alabama. I, pretty, pretty good, good. stuff. Yeah. Pretty, pretty very good. Uh, and we, we've kind of been harping on this uh, slow paced defense, I mean, slow paced offense that he has going. I will say his average possession time since 2017 is around 235th in the nation. Uh, They really changed heavily in the 2022 to 2023 year. So not this last year, but the year before that, where they then went to the 350s, one of the slowest in the entire nation. But prior to that, they were hovering around 100, uh, about 150 to 270 was kind of that that range in the first five or so years. Uh, And then really, really slowed things down because I think that's what fits him the best for his Moorhead State teams the last two years. Uh, an interesting thing about what we can expect out of a Preston Spradlin's coached Dukes team. I left the playbook in Moorhead. Like it's about players, right? And it's about playing efficiently and it's about learning your team, building trust and putting those guys in the best positions to showcase their strengths and minimize their weaknesses. Um, people will say, man, they run a lot of stuff. They run a lot of sets. We do, but it's like, that's not my stuff. It's stuff that we come up with and we put in 
to accommodate our players. Kind of feels like our dream coach, like the two of us. <laughs> <laughs> He's talking about like efficiency. He was talking at, at one point, he talks about like the usage rate, right? Of that 6'10 post player. <laughs> They're talking about like he clearly looks at stats and numbers and is focused on like being very efficient on both ends, which is like for us, Ken Palm dorks, sort of like a, <laughs> a very exciting time. So I'm pretty excited for the way he runs a program. I'm super excited. When he was talking about that, we, we adapt to the players. I was like, that's music to my ears because there were so many times under, the, even under the Byington era, yeah. like, he's a great coach. He does what he does though. It is three pointers and play inside. He's a very analytics driven type of coach, but there were times where it was just like the mid range game is working. Stop driving into Justin absent. Stop getting blocked. And it's just like, this is what we do. This is how we're going to do. It. And it sounds like Spradlin is very much of the mind of, you know, if something's not working, I'm going to, I'm going to talk with the team and, and lean into what they're thinking. You know, if, if we have a fast paced uh, three and D type of team, that's what we're going to run. If we have a slow team that, you know, might not be the best offensively, we might grind you to a pulp and just lean on our great defense. We may see a vastly different team in terms of what Ken Palm says year in and year out. And I'm, I'm excited for that. They also share it well offensively. Drew Thelwell, I think it is this year, who's also in the portal, um, averaged over six assists per game. Portal, portal, portal. He had um, he actually had 19 in a game. It was against, I think it was against Alice Lloyd, the NAI team that uh, Spradlin played at when he was a, a college student. But puts up some great numbers. They've had multiple guys in the past who are you know well over five assists per game would not be shocked if jmu has a player on its roster that leads the Sun Belt and assists next year so they pass it they play good defense kind of feels like the old people in the stands for jmu games or like like valley residents who are like 70 plus are gonna be like really pleased with this that's how you play but, basketball right there yeah it's like follow your own shot like all those kind of like cliche <laughs> cliche share the rock make the extra pass make the extra <laughs> yeah. pass. you gotta pass it five times before you take a shot i just feel like they're gonna make a lot of really smart plays and considering he should be able to get better athletes at jamie than morehead state that seems exciting um let, let's change gears and talk a little bit about transfer portal and nil and before we do that this was a great uh great insight into how preston spradlin is going to handle this era of college athletics specifically when it comes to nil deals you know nil wasn't really a part of what we do at, at moorhead state um and it's not necessarily going to be a part of how we recruit at jmu just to be quite frank with you um, I'm, I'm not going to get away from having people that want to be there for the right reasons um, it's a part of the landscape now um, but it's certainly not going to be the, the forefront of why we recruit um, you know, we're not going to get in bidding wars and all those things. I'll be honest with it. And, and via the portal, the last three, four years, I have had zero NIL conversations with a recruit. And I would give my staff tons of credit for that because obviously they do the, the work ahead of time um, to, to fill players out and kind of see what they're looking for. And if, you know, that's coming up in the first, you know, um, conversation or two, that's just not on the right list of priorities for us, to be quite honest with you. I get it. It's part of the deal. Um, I'm excited to embrace uh, the resources and the, uh, the ability to have some of those things at JMU, but it's not going to be the reason that um, that we bring players, you know, here to JMU. They're going to come for the right reasons. They're going to come because they want to be a part of the championship program. They want to be challenged. They want to grow um, not just as players, but they want to grow as men off the court. And so uh, that's where it's going to start for us, and that's how we're going to, you know, approach the NIL. Um, and, and the landscape that it's in right now. Seems fair for JMU's current situation, right? It seems very fair, and, and it lines up almost in lockstep with what the Montpelier Collective has said that their goal is. It's not going out and paying players to come to JMU. It's a retention tool, and I think that's what Preston Spradlin kind of agrees with and is in lockstep with, and it's also evident in the players that Spradlin goes and gets in the transfer portal. Yeah, he gets a lot of guys, right, who are under-recruited, maybe played at smaller schools. I mean, there's a possibility you could look at guys even who are playing D2 or, or something like that. He's not going to go out, I wouldn't think, and add a bunch of, like, Power 5 flameouts. So there's right. obviously a possibility he adds some of those kind of guys, but he's done a really good job of recruiting 
high school players and then transfers who aren't like well-known guys. Yeah, the top three players for uh, Moorhead State this past year in terms of Ken Palm, their overall offensive rating and, and usage was Riley Minix, who was an NAIA All-American during his time at Southeastern, used his last year of eligibility, his graduate year at Moorhead State, turned into one of the best players in the OVC. Uh, Jordan Lathan, two years at Moorhead State, started his career at UTEP, then to Milwaukee, and then used his senior and grad year at Moorhead State. So it's that kind of a guy that never really found a footing, never really found a true quote-unquote home, found his way to Moorhead State. Preston Spradlin got the most out of him. Drew Thelwell, their third most used player. You mentioned him earlier. He's in the transfer portal. Uh, he was a Moorhead recruit uh, and kind of a homegrown talent. So you see there a mix of a little bit of everything, an NIA, NAIA type of guy, a you know mid-major level player. UTEP had some success there, found his way to Milwaukee, couldn't really hold on there, and then finds his way to Moorhead for whatever reason, three, three schools, but really catches on and spends his most time with Preston Spradlin and then Drew Thelwell, a, a high school guy that he was able to recruit and develop into a top-end OVC player. He seems to develop really well. You mentioned uh, Lathan or whatever, UTEP, Milwaukee, and then Moorhead State. He never had an offensive rating at any of those schools over 92, which he had his freshman year at UTEP. 109.8 at Moorhead State. He was just way more efficient. Like everything he did, he was he leans better. into his strengths. Like th I think that's I think that's evident that Preston Spradlin leans into his players' strengths. Yep, leans into the strengths, helps him get better over time. Just seems like kind of a perfect coach for what JMU is. Because I know fans obviously think of JMU as as like fringe P5 going up, doing all these great things. They can't compete in bidding wars. It's not just that like Spradlin maybe doesn't want to. They can't. They can't. Yeah. I mean, they, yeah, they, they very well cannot. Uh, going back to then 2022 to 2023, those top three players, Mark Freeman, Alex Gross, Jake Wolf. Uh, Mark Freeman became the OVC player of the year and was the preseason player of the year heading into this past season. Got injured two weeks before the season, uh, but he was a Tennessee State to Illinois State player again then found his way to Moorhead State first year with the program is the OVC player of the year Alex Gross NAIA for four years used his final year of eligibility with uh, Moorhead State then Jake Wolf was at Lipscomb for three years used his final two years at Moorhead State and was the most effective he was so it, it's really really promising yeah just they seem to find ways to develop players in a really impressive way and then find guys in the portal if they can get them for more than a year, they develop well, but they play to their strengths and maximize one year, two years, whatever out of those players. Yeah. Uh, so I want to take this into a kind of a quick little chat just to throw these ideas off of you because this coaching search opened my eyes, I think, a lot more to the life of a mid-major than I think football did because football went out and got arguably one of the hottest names on the market. Bob Chesney was in the running to be Syracuse's head coach. He's kind of always floated around Boston. Like, that's a power five type of coach. And JMU was able to go out, lure him to JMU for the opportunity to grow his coaching resume even more and continue to go out. So I think the, the life of a mid-major is a little different on the football side because on the basketball side, I was sitting there and I was like, well, why can't we go out and get the best coach from, you know, the Missouri Valley? Why can't we go and get the best coach from the SoCon? Th these are guys that, you know, Jamie's probably a slight pay increase. And then you kind of think about it and you're like, man, life is a mid major when your coach gets poached sucks because that hire is going to be so much more difficult than the football hire. You're trying to poach a coach from a one bid league to a one bid league with for a minimal pay raise, maybe not minimal, but it's not the pay raise of Mark Byington going from 600,000 to assume a 3 million ish a year. And, you're asking a guy to leave a culture and a program that he has built to then do it all again at a James Madison program that hasn't had a lot of success in the last decade. And it just was really like, Oh, it, this is, this is different. I think that's really well said, right? Where football has kind of proven the last decade to be a great stepping stone if you want a, a bigger opportunity and maybe with even Signetti showing power five opportunities or power two, right? If you're talking big 10 sec, Byington showed that, but it's, it's just one. 
example, I think if Spradlin's able to have success and take another job, it completely changes yeah. the landscape of, of who JMU could look at. And then also they kind of need to like, you know, have a president and AD in place to, <laughs> to really make a huge leap in candidates as well. But Spradlin, you, yeah, lower level, maybe flew under our radar a little bit. Definitely seems like he fits the mold of a guy who could take a, a bigger job given his age and um, experience. And he fits the mold that Jeff Bourne has gone after very hard ever since the terrible Lou Rowe fire. Yeah, Jeff Bourne loves himself a proven head coach. <laughs> he said, we're never again hiring it. I don't care what team it is for. That, that Lou Rowe experience has ruined it. But it, it just really was eye-opening that poaching from one mid one bid mid-major league to another one bid mid-major league is really, really difficult. And good news over with our friends at App State. They signed Dusty Kearns to a six-year extension, meaning he's gone at the end of next year. But really good to see that uh, he'll at least be in the conference for another year because I think if those two teams can battle at the top of the Sun Belt, it's going to be a really fun conference next year. Yeah, Arkansas State, I think, is one that could make a oh, huge yeah. leap. So there could be some some better basketball, and maybe it elevates the league's image or reputation or whatever, which would be, I guess, beneficial for everybody. Giving a rating to this hire, because Preston Spradlin, it was a name you had on your preliminary list. He didn't make the cut for whatever reason. For me, he wasn't even on my list. I, I didn't even look at him when we had like the top coaching candidates to target when we had that video up on our YouTube. But I think after everything, I give this an A hire. I think it's a great hire. I think he's very calm. He seems like somebody who's willing to adapt. He he seems similar to Byington in that way, where maybe even more willing to adapt. But Byington was never like too high or too low. He was yeah, kind of like annoyingly. Yeah, he's like, we're going with the process. We're sticking to what we're trying to do. We're going to get better. We're going to prepare ourselves for March. Feels like Spradlin's doing the same thing. But he comes to JMU with like way more success than Byington did. Byington had never made an NIT or NCAA tournament until this year. Spradlin's gone to two NCAA tournaments and an NIT. Like he's proven he can take a mid-major to the big dance, which is what you're looking for. And I think they are like one sixteenth more head state in Ken Palm right now, which mm -hmm. sort of moves occasionally because you still have some teams playing. That'd be third in the Sun Belt this year. It's like you could have dropped his Moorhead team into the Sun Belt, and they're definitely top half. And I think they're a step below App and JMU, but then right there is the third team, certainly competitive with Arkansas State, competitive with Troy, like Louisiana could have made the Sun Belt title game, right? So it's if you take that team, plop it in, they're already competitive. Now you imagine he'd be able to get slightly higher level of talent, more fans, I would assume, at games, right? More fan support little NIL money to retain some guys. Seems like the ceiling would be pretty high. Seems like the ceiling is the the ceiling. What's the ceiling saying? Is, the ceiling is a sky? Ceiling is the roof. Ceiling is the roof. That's what it is. <laughs> um, do you want to do the bouncing ball story here before we move to transfer portal talk? Yeah, this was a fun one. This was a great story uh, about how bouncing a ball – taught him a lot about being a coach that interim season that I had was was really difficult you know we took over and a lot of uh, difficult things happening and so um, we were able to flip it and kind of turn the corner because I did not make that season about me and getting the job I did I believe it was four or five games we won in a row and then you start hearing the outside noise right you start hearing everybody say well they should just give Preston a job and uh, you know, go ahead and rip off the interim tag and all these things. And um, I had done a good job of distracting that to get or blocking that out rather to get to that point. But then, you know, human nature, you know, seeks into all of us, especially when you're 29 years old and you open up your Twitter, Twitter feed and you start to say, you know what, they're right. Maybe they should give me that job. And I'll never forget. I got humbled quickly. Uh, we played a game at, at Tennessee Tech, uh, a game in which we probably should have won. And it came down to the wire. And uh, I remember we needed to foul. We came out of a timeout and we talked exactly about how Tech was going to run an out of bounds play to get it to the best free throw shooter. This is how we would um, strategize and, and take that away so that a poor free throw shooter would catch it. Uh, we executed it beautifully. And the, the guy who shoots about 50% caught the ball and we looked at him and we looked at him and then we looked at him again. Then he throws it to a guy that shoots 90% and we fouled him. Right. And so then the ball rolls over to me. I remember I'm, I'm squatted down and the ball comes to me 
and I pick it up and I go to slam it. And I really, truly, this is true. I meant to just kind of slam and hit it. I slammed it so hard. It almost went to the top of the uh, Hooper Evelyn center there at, at Tennessee Tech. And the ref just kind of looked at me and he's like, man, I got to do it. So he teed me up. So we lose the game. It was a one point game. He teed me up. And it was at that point, the very first time I had ever taken a game away from my players. That's a fun story. And then he said after that, he um, like apologized to all the seniors the next day and they went on a little winning streak after that. I love that story because it really spoke to uh, my heart because as a kid, a college student who got teed up, who got a double tech once in an intramural game, I respect it. I respect a good old fashioned ball slam to get a tech. I like that. Also, shout out to Jarvis Heron with WHSV who asked specifically about that story that he had seen in another yes. interview. His research for for that presser was very impressive and good. It was amazing. He was asking deep cut questions. He was like, I know everyone else will scratch the surface. Let me get real yeah. in there. with <laughs> like, Let me cook for a second. <laughs> let me ask the most specific questions that no one has heard of. Um, yeah, great stuff from him. But do you want to dive into the transfer portal a little bit? Real quick, I want to say I think Spradlin Coach strikes Pete. me as somebody who would be beloved by like every grandmother in the country. Doesn't he just seem like like such a nice, wholesome guy that, that I think can relate quote. to he can relate to everybody. I could listen to him tell stories all day. He seems very soothing with like the southern accent. Kentucky it's the southern accent, accent that's got you yeah. going. Yep, yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. That's a great point. He sold me completely just with like listening to him, his calm demeanor. I'm like, yeah, do whatever you want, the portal. I trust you. <laughs> no wonder a kid from an NIIA school will be coming into the portal. And there's Preston Spradlin on the other side of the phone call. Hey, son, you want to come play for me at James Madison University? <laughs> you like defense? <laughs> you like defense and an offense that's catered to your abilities? We can do that for you. Um, okay, moving from all that terrible <laughs> southern accent back to the transfer portal. Can we dive into this a little bit? Where do you want to start? Players to target or players that have come and left and are still in? Well, we got we got X back, right? Xavier Brown's coming back. Big time. That's big. That's big time. Is it hyperbolic to say that I think he has the capability to grow into a Sunbelt player of the year type of player? I think he could. I think he showcased some of that like scoring ability um, in the Sunbelt Championship game when he had 21 and then like 10 rebounds or whatever. Although Spradlin was saying he doesn't, you know, he wants his teams to only take good shots. So I don't know if the logo threes will uh, be considered a good shot or not. We'll have to find out come November. Uh, but I think he can do really well because he's already pretty good at taking care of the ball and passing it. So he could be the type of guy who gets 10 plus points, five plus assists and helps defensively as well. I think he fits what Spradlin wants to do pretty well. Yeah, I think it's it's going to be a really good fit. Uh, Raquan Horton, Terrence Edwards actually just went to Louisville. We always knew yeah. he wasn't going to be coming back. Justin Amati uh, remain in Portal. Horton would be a big one. Carries going to Vanderbilt. Edwards, you mentioned going to Louisville, which I think is a pretty darn good spot for him. I think that's a great landing spot for Terrence Edwards. I'm excited we, to see him there. Yeah, we got to talk a little bit about JMU fans for a minute with some of these <laughs> Portal takes. Okay, hit me. People, so like Carrie goes to Vanderbilt, and I think people mostly were accepting of that one because Byington is Byington. There were some takes after the the Louisville commitment for for Edwards today, where people were like, "Ah, dumpster fire of a program." Just say you don't pay attention to college basketball because <laughs> the program is not a dumpster fire. Kenny Payne was a dumpster fire. He's been fired. They put out <laughs> the dumpster fire. They hired Pat Kelsey, who's been a phenomenal mid-major coach, who runs an up-tempo offense, which that fits, fits Edwards Terrence perfectly. perfectly. He's getting an NIL bag, I would assume, is upward of is somewhere in like hundreds of thousands of dollars. I've seen rumors. It's all rumors. I haven't confirmed this of eight hundred thousand. I've also heard rumors that Kiki Jefferson got two hundred and fifty thousand. So I would imagine. That the floor is 250, the ceiling is 800 for Terrence Edwards. He's definitely getting at least six figures. 
Yes. Like he's a conference player of the year who's trying to reinvigorate a Louisville program. Their fans are awesome, right? They have diehard basketball fans. He wants to play professionally. So he's going to have a whole year where he can play against ACC teams. They'll play Kentucky, right? They'll have a good non-conference schedule where you can put all this stuff on tape. You can develop your game. You're getting paid. You're playing in the ACC. How would how would that be worse than coming back? 13, heck, I think you said it, 10 a game on effective and efficient shooting in the ACC looks a lot better than what his 17.7 points per game in the Sun Belt. It's like if you if you're sad that he left, I get that. I'm sad. Like great player, but he's been nothing but positive about James. He's been amazing. And he and we knew this was his last year. Like yeah, that, that's the other thing. About that. He's been clear about everything. He left JMU in a better place than where he found it. Go get your back. If he wanted to go to Texas A&M Panhandle or whatever it is, and they were paying him a massive bag, go do it. Go go be better. Go go move on. Go experience life. Like, I, he's but a also dude. like good for him. The ACC had a down year. They sent an 11 seed to the Final Four. They got five teams in. And I saw some people that are like, if he came back, had to think we'd be better. It's like, what did you? Like, Pat Kelsey can coach, man. Like, maybe Jamie's – maybe they reload and they're, and they're great. But you still got to win the conference tournament, right? Jamie was – what were they going into the conference tournament? 30 wins and they still weren't going to get an at-large? Like, You can make the NCAA tournament easily as an at-large if you finish in the middle of the pack of the ACC next year. Not only that, you're teaming up with Pat Kelsey – an accomplished mid-major coach who runs, like you said, a high-tempo offense that fits Terrence Edwards' play style perfectly. Number three, you're beloved by the JMU fans. You're never going to have to buy a beer the next time you're in Harrisonburg. For the rest of Edwards' life, he's going to be a beloved Duke. There might be a jersey hanging in the rafters one day. They might choose to retire his number. We'll see because best player conference player of the year on the historically in terms of wins best team in JMU history might warrant some sort of recognition besides all that now you can go to Louisville get a bag potentially make an at-large make the NCAA tournament as an at-large or heck maybe win the ACC if Pat Kelsey has it turned around in an astronomical quickness but then not only that if you help lead Louisville to this quote-unquote revival that Pat Kelsey's banging his chest about you're going to be beloved by Louisville fans. It's a win-win. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just crazy to me. But also, I saw some other people that are like, oh, I mean, like, dumpster fire, like, unless they're changing over the whole roster. They are. Okay, every scholarship player from this year is no longer, like, they're either in the portal or they're just gone. So they've completely overhauled the roster. They already added two Charleston kids, including somebody who shoots, like, 40% from three and made over 100 threes this year. And then a 6'11 freshman this year shot like 80% from two and Terrence Edwards. So they've already got like a core that it's like a top 100 looking team. They're going to add more around that. Like I'd be surprised if Louisville isn't a top 100 team. And if Louisville doesn't make a push to be more like top 50 in fighting for an NCAA tournament berth, it seems like a really cool landing spot. Yeah. And speaking of, Cores being rebuilt, like what Pat Kelsey has done. Preston Spradlin has to do that here with the Dukes. Three guys in the portal right now that I think JMU may be landing. Yes, Moorhead State has three guys in the portal. Eddie Ricks is a 6'7 freshman wing slash forward. Yeah. Real quick. They all were in the portal, I think, before this hire was announced. Ricks may have been after the, the hire, but Freeman has been in the yeah. portal as yes. well as Thelwell. So this isn't necessarily uh -huh. as much poaching as it is taking advantage of the players that are in the portal. Yeah, kind of similar to Holy Cross, I feel like, right, where it wasn't wasn't the – like a lot of the guys were out of yes. Holy Cross options for academics. So Eddie Ricks, six seven, really – he was a freshman this year. He led Moorhead State in blocks. I think he had like 39 or something. Can score, can rebound, good defender. Makes a lot of sense if they're able to get him. Drew Thelwell, we talked about earlier a little bit, led the team in assists this year, I believe. I think he had like over 200 total assists with six assists per game. Really, really good. Can score, can defend, 
And then Mark Freeman, who is out this season with injury, uh, wrist injury, but was last year's um, OVC player of the year, 5'11". So you're getting a point here with Thelwell, 6'3", kind of a point guard. Freeman's also a point guard. Xavier, Xavier Brown. Brown's a point guard. So I don't know if they're necessarily getting all these guys, but three names to monitor, and I think it obviously fit the system and then would would definitely be good enough to play in the Sun Belt. Yeah, and Bronny James might slot in there as well. Yeah, that was funny when the guy was just observing that he saw like a fake Bronny James thing. It was like, Bronny James in the portal. And everyone's like, look at this report. I don't think he's <laughs> reporting that. Yeah. <laughs> uh- yeah, I think all of those fit. I think Thelwell and Freeman, it'll be interesting to see what they decide on. Freeman may actually have looks from uh, potentially even higher up teams. He can score. He can score OVC player of the year. Will be interesting to see what his market is like coming off of that injury. Um, and kind of like Spradlin said, JMU won't be using NIL to bring people in. Right. So if Freeman has the opportunity, even get, even if it's $25,000, $50,000, might want to go to another like JMU similar type of team because he only has one year left. Thelwell also one year left might run into that same thing. Eddie Ricks though. I think I would almost stamp it that he's coming to JMU. Um, another guy I want to just throw out there, not source this at all. I, I just as m- this is my pure vibes. It's another <laughs> is it guard. A, is it a Queens player? <laughs> it is. It's Dayton Albury. Okay. What's he, what's you just he, like his game. His game is the most electric game in the nation. He was, I believe, newcomer of the year or was on something with the A-Sun. He was a baller. Came from uh, the JUCO ranks, made the jump up, and was arguably the most dominant player on a night-in, night-out basis in the A-Sun. He is a slashing guard that plays downhill at one of the fastest rates I've seen ever. Uh, he has bunny hops. He can jump out of a gym, insert whatever cliche you want. A really, really good player that plays the two at a very, very elite level. Um, he's gotten looks from Virginia Tech and K-State, but everyone else that's looked at him are all mid-majors around JMU. So uh could be interesting. I haven't seen JMU linked to him at all, but he entered the portal about a month and a half ago, like right when Queen's season ended. And so... I think that'd be a fun one. He's just an electric player. I like that. I like that a lot. The current roster, there's a lot of a lot of holes to fill, right? So you've got Holman Smith gone. Holman Smith gone. <laughs> yeah, I was surprised when I saw that come across my timeline, but hey, <laughs> everybody get into the portal. That's gonna be a big loss. But Roberson, not in the portal, right? Quincy Allen. So you have a couple guys who haven't played a lot. Allen more so due to injury, but some size there. Allen six eight. Roberson 6'9", can they develop into something? You've got Brown, some other guys in the portal that maybe come back, but like a lot, a lot to fill. Well, I mean, they lost Michael Green, Terrence Edwards, Jalen Carey, TJ Bickerstaff, right there with TJ Bickerstaff and Jalen Carey, two of the most dominant fives in the conference. Mm-hmm. You also lost Julian Wooden, one of the best stretch fours in the conference. I mean, Friedel. You know, a Friedel, one of the best shooting threes in the conference. So you really have to completely revamp your front court. Jarrell Roberson might take that step forward. Quincy Allen might be that stretch forward type of player for you. Uh, but you really have to completely revamp that front court. It's, it's going to be fascinating. And the back court. <laughs> fascinating to watch because uh, Spradlin has a lot of opportunity to kind of do whatever he wants with the roster because there's just not that much returning at all so you've got options there obviously brown is is talented and expected to be a leader and i think in the nil era very very cool to have somebody like brown who is a spark plug who loves jmu and kind of feels like he could be if he takes that leap similar to edwards just the face of the program that everybody rallies behind and that's exciting i i was when i saw xavier was coming back i got so hyped He's he's a baller. I think he's going to be a Sun Belt Player of the Year. Maybe not this year, but I think his senior year he will be. I also like him on a team that's like defense focused. I just feel like he's going to be super yeah. aggressive. Ton of oh, steals. So much clapping. His hands so are right much right. clapping. I can't wait. I think it's and I think the whatever it was fifty two and six home record for Moorhead the last few years. I think the AUBC, especially in conference play, is going to be very very hard to to beat the Dukes in there. So we also we named Mark Freeman, Thelwell, and Ricks 
three guys from Moorhead. There is an interesting clause in the Preston Spradlin contract where Jamie would have to pay Moorhead State $4,000 per player that they get to transfer from Moorhead State. Does that apply if they were in the portal before the hire was made? I don't know the exact details there. Some of it um, seemed like, I guess, if you contacted guys based on Moorhead connections, there was a little bit. Um, I hadn't seen many clauses like that, so I don't know a lot of those things. I know Matt Brady had a similar clause when he was coming over from Maris that led to some some legal disputes. <laughs> um, but regardless, like $12,000 for three rotational players feels low. I think you're you're – plenty pleased with that because you got a $1 million buyout for Byington and they paid Moorhead state $275,000 for Spradlin. So like you've got a lot of 750 K <laughs> that you've got from that. I think you're willing to spend 12,000. If it's like a guy who knows the system is going to put people in your arena to watch a good team play. So I, I don't think the price is much of a concern at all. Yeah, I agree. Um, do you want to do listener questions here or do listener questions at the end? Should we do them here? I, I think most of them are going to be men's basketball focused considering the breaking news that happened since our last podcast. So let's do listener questions here. Okay. Let me throw one at you. Okay. From our friend, Daniel Merriman, Xavier Brown stat line prediction for next season. Ten point eight points per game, four point nine assists per game, two point one steals per game. I don't know on rebounds. Two point one steals per game? That seems high. What did he have this year? For a Preston Spradlin defense that is not known for getting a lot of turnovers. But he's gonna be that guy. How many okay. steals did he? He had fifty two this year in thirty six games. So he was one point something. Okay. It's a bit of a leap. It is a bit of a leap. Uh Peter Carey. With the departure of Clemson and FSU leaving the ACC in 2025 for Big Ten, is that true? I don't think that's set in stone at all. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I don't think that's like a guaranteed thing. I do think they'll eventually leave, but I don't know that the 2025 thing is like locked. So the, the last part of this question, do you anticipate a push for schools like the ECUs, the App States, the JMUs of the world, all battle-tested in sports, looking to lobby for invites as replacements? Uh Peter believes that UNC, Virginia Tech, and UVA will be the next two to three schools who leave. Yeah, that makes sense. I think that the interesting thing is football might go to some sort of super league at some point or whatever. Football kind of drives realignment. So I think that the question would be, is it a big enough of a super league that JMU could be included? And if it's not, there, I don't see any benefit to going to like the washed up remnants of the ACC, right? Because like yeah. playing Wake Forest instead of Coastal Carolina is just like a nothing burger. Like yeah. no offense to Wake Forest, but that's not a huge needle mover. But I also think if that happens, I think you'd have other conferences, specifically the Big 12, that would poach some of those kind of like fringy ACC schools where I don't even know if there would be like an ACC to go into. Yeah, I think at the rate everything's happening, like you said, a Super League, and then the reason JMU, at least for myself, and Peter, I don't know if you agree with this, but the reason I want to be in the ACC is to get Virginia Tech and UVA on the on the schedule each and every year in all of the yeah. major sports. Like, I don't want to go to an ACC that's just the branded ACC with JMU, App State, ECU, and Coastal. Just stay in the Sun Belt. Just, <laughs> right. just keep the Sun Belt. Like, if, if you're going to an ACC that doesn't have Virginia Tech and UVA and it's lost all of its teeth without Clemson and Florida State, what's the point? And I, I agree with you there. So do I think they'll vie for that? Maybe. But I also think athletic directors, which JMU does not have, uh, are aware that, you know, there's a there's a change of coming. Yeah. And then, like, the other question for the athletic director, right, is, like, you going to pay your – <laughs> athletes as employees like is jmu yeah. gonna be able to do that can they compete with with other schools are there some schools in the Sun Belt that don't that get left behind and then maybe like some teams in the east pull i don't know there's a lot of just unknown so it's hard to kind of say what what is best uh joey needham said since quincy allen is not in the portal do you think next year has a chance to be a breakout year for him 
In limited action last year, it still seemed like he had the most pure talent on the team to me. I would agree with that, Joey. I think Quincy Allen, I mean, he was a four-star recruit that went to a Pac-12 school for a reason. I think he might be one of the most raw talent type of guys. Now, how do you extract that into playing well in a team, uh, growing as a player, and being efficient? We saw the height of Quincy Allen. I believe he had a 20-point, some crazy game where he was like, four for four from deep. He had one great game last year for JMU, and then he was kind of injured and then was injured the rest of the season. I mean, he has the opportunity to take over that four spot, maybe even the three spot. Yeah, he can fill it up when he really, really gets going. So he's one that's super athletic. If they could find a way to play to his strengths, then yeah. And if he's healthy, right, then then he could certainly have a breakout year. Because he was injured at Colorado too. Yeah. So... He's kind of had the injury bug his entire career. Chris L, hashtag go Dukes. Let's talk about buyouts. Why are we not having a little higher amount? Is the coach worried that he might have to pay it? I think $1 million for buying Tim was pretty decent. I think the question is, it's $1 million. Why didn't we make it one25 for Spradlin? Why didn't we make it one5 for Spradlin? I don't know. I think part of it is there's there's an agreement on both sides that like you're getting a good coach your buyout covers more than the next coach's salary for a year that seems like a fair i'm sure there's like an industry standard for bio percentage or something that they're probably following but also yeah if you're spradlin like part of the deal is that you're going to try to win a lot of games and if you do jmu is aware that you're going to try to move on so you're not going to have like a 13 million dollar buyout or something ridiculous where a power five team is is not going to ever want to pay that. So then you're kind of stuck at JMU. So there's sort of both ways, right? Spradlin also has negotiating power because he's won 20 games in four consecutive years and made two NCAA tournaments. Yeah. I think it's all negotiation. Yeah. Like, okay, you're going to, I'll do this on the salary. If you do this on the buyout, you'll do this on the buyout. I'll do this on this. It's, it's all part of the contract. It's all part of negotiation. Um, so I, I would imagine JMU may have tried to have a little higher amount, but then once it came out that Byington's buyout was a million, I think things changed and uh, Spradling quickly had some some negotiation leverage. Billy Matthews Jr. Has anyone else noticed that a majority of Chesney, so we're switching gears to football, Chesney's coaching staff talk just like him, <laughs> especially D. Michael. It's like a cult. And give me the Kool-Aid because I'm drinking it. What's y'all's excitement level over spring practices? <laughs> Chesney's an interesting fella. <laughs> and his coaches seem, yeah, they do seem like some of them are, are very similar to him. I'm excited though. <laughs> I am too, but he, but that's such a great point. Cause that's a oh funny my, question. Oh my goodness. There are times when I'm listening to Chesney talk post practice and I'm like, how, how is this man successful? He just says buzzwords and <laughs> fills it in with right after every three words, right? His energy is so constant. It would, <laughs> it would like just in the pressers. I think there was one where they were talking to, um, I can't remember Jacob Thomas, I guess. And they were asking him about, somebody asked him about Chesney and Chesney was behind him, making sure that a group of students that like are considering being sports journalists were close enough. And he was like, everybody move, move a little bit so they can get closer. This is, <laughs> this is a great opportunity for them too. And it's just like, he's constantly like opportunities and everything's well, let's go. <laughs> He's amped up constantly. You you could ask him the worst question in the world. Like next year, if we're ever at a press conference, I might just give him the worst question in the world to see what his reaction is. Because I imagine it'll be arms crossed, or if he's at a table, you know, sitting there, hands on the table. Yeah, yeah, great question. I mean, it's all about the opportunities. I mean, I just I love the opportunity. It's just to get out there and really coach with these guys and to be present in every moment and just to really give them the opportunity to go out there and be great. I tell them, right, be great, right? You got to be out there, right, and be right, great. It's just like, whoa, man. <laughs> it's like Russell Wilson asks sometimes. <laughs> but he also – Hey, um... hey, hey, hey. <laughs> hey, let's okay, not smirch Seattle's best quarterback, all right? Maybe not that far. But he also uh... – his, yeah, his energy is just uh, infectious. He loves to say stuff like competing, <laughs> which a lot of coaches say, where they're just like, we're trying to compete. And I was like, I mean, I'd hope. <laughs> like, it's a very physical sport, right? You're trying to maybe Red make the college football playoff. <laughs> yeah, I had hoped there'd be positional competition in the spring. That's good to hear, though. Oh, wait, I have to go on record about positional competition. 
Dylan Morris is going to be the day one starter. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Dylan Morris is JMU starting quarterback. Yeah, I would be shocked if it goes the other way. If if he's not the starting quarterback week one because of talent, like if there's a crazy injury, I will eat a pair of jeans. <laughs> I hope it's the same as last year and you eat a pair of jeans and then he's like started by week two and wins conference player of the year, but you got to eat denim. <laughs> All right, Dan Miller. How can JMU uh, – actually, I'll use this one as a segue. Uh, this is going to be Mike Shoemate. Can Xavier convince some teammates to stay at JMU as well? What kind of talent can Coach bring with him from Moorhead? We broke that down a little bit earlier. Do you expect Xavier Brown to get on the phones and try to get Raekwon back? He did an interview with Rigger where he's like, I'm recruiting guys that I know that have good character. And I was just cracking up. Like, he's out there. He's working the phones. I don't know if it's his teammates – or if he's talking to like guys at other schools or in the portal or, or what he was alluding to. Horton's really good. Horton seems like he should be playing at a power conference. But if they're able to get him or Amadi back, that'd be pretty impressive. Amadi, I think, maybe could be somewhat realistic, um, given the fact that he missed a whole year with injury and his role was diminished the year before. So maybe some major programs are a little bit scared away. But he had pretty significant mid-major interest last year, Amadi, when he entered. Yeah. Be interesting. All right, this is a great segue. How can JMU convince more students to attend baseball games? More dollar dog days? How about that dodgeball squad? Dodgeball's fine, whatever. How can JMU convince more students to attend baseball games? I have a crazy idea. Apologize to me. <laughs> that would just lead to sellouts. They're like, finally. <laughs> They apologize to Jack. Win, win games, win series. You want to talk? Are we talking baseball? Yeah, we're talking baseball. Okay. Oh wait, 16. we didn't talk women's basketball. Crazy roster shakeup with women's basketball. Steph Oderkirk in the portal, Chloe mm -hmm. Sterling in the portal, and Neil Harrow has left the team to go be an assistant coach for the LA Sparks of the WNBA. Good for him. <laughs> He's massive. Claps to Neil. I mean, that is that's awesome, man. That's a great move up. Uh, Coach O's got his work cut out for him. We'll report as things come through and how they're going to replace Neil Harrow um, and how they're going to kind of work in the transfer portal. They have added one player already. Yeah, Rose Scott from Marshall. Yes. She can score, plays at the guard position. Shane Metlin had some nice stuff on the women's team. Um, they're working on not being bad against the full court press. Thank goodness. Arguably 12 months too late, but still good to do. Uh, makes sense. They're trying to, they're looking for a potentially a veteran point guard in the portal. They don't have a ton of open roster spots, but I think Coach O thinks that'll help with the turnovers and with Sterling leaving. Makes a lot of sense. They return a lot of talent next year. They should be good. So good stuff there. And then he wants an experienced assistant to take over for Harrow, which makes sense also. I'm excited to see what what happens over there. All right, so back to back to the Diamond Dukes. Um, how can people, you know, go to the games? Mangy Dog says free beer. I'm all for free beer. Think that would be a great thing. Um, but but really, at the end of the day, it's win games. <laughs> I feel like you're you're maybe even more jovial than normal, knowing that the apology requests have, have completely dissipated by this point. 16 and 12 overall. They're three and six. Three and six in conference. Wait, wait, wait. Time out. Remember when they beat Arkansas in one game? They beat them seven to three, and people were like, uh oh, Jack. Uh oh, you're going to have to apologize. I have not seen someone asking for my apology since, hmm, March 12th. It's been yeah. nearly a month since someone has asked for my apology. Yeah, they so they had the coastal series like almost won. They should have won it, and they they let it go away. They lose to Maryland. They lose the series to Texas State. They lose the series to Georgia State after winning the first game, fourteen to six. I don't like the whole thing that we said was that they don't go to regionals. That was the whole thing, and I'm I'm back in now. Now that I don't have to be near an apology, I want to be on this take two. 
Thank, no, thanks for <laughs> finally joining me. No, 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 wait. We can't have a, a fair weather takester here. Wait, no, 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 no. I've been out on my island taking bullets for the beginning of this non-conference schedule. And now that the bullets have stopped, you're going to bravely stand next to me and take it. Take nothing. You're gonna, yeah, you're right, Jack. You're right. Yeah, I was hoping that you would apologize. I was hoping they would figure it out. So I was, I was so actually was seeing- I. I was feeding into it. I was being like, when are you going to apologize? When are you going to apologize? <laughs> Not soon, it appears. And they, there's a lot of baseball left. But the whole thing, and, and the, especially your thing, right, is that they don't go to regionals under Ike. They've never been to a regional. They don't seem poised to go to a regional again. So, like, what do you, what's the point? I mean, they're poised for a middle-of-the-pack finish in the Sun Belt Conference. If they rally a little, where are they right now? Three and six, they're not high. I mean, you got to imagine they're going to start pulling out some wins. But, I mean, you also look at the schedule. Tied for last. They're tied for last right now. App State, you should win that series at home. Then you're on the road at – play, though. I know, but then – and so that makes it even tougher because then you're at ODU. You're likely going to be swept by the Monarchs, who are pretty good this year. Georgia Southern at home, maybe a win, win series. South Alabama, you, you got to go to Mobile. You got to hope you're pulling out two of the three. Pretty sure Arkansas State is pretty good this year. They're hanging in. They're three and six in league, but they're 16 and 15 overall. Like a lot of these teams, I think the only team with a losing overall record this year is Marshall at nine and 18. Everybody else is 500 or better on the season. Somehow JMU is still 32nd in the RPI because of that Arkansas win to start the year. And I guess Tech helps them a little. Oh, that Tech win does look bit, but very, very good. But, like, you're likely going to finish the game on a four-game losing streak at Troy, at Virginia Tech. You got to take advantage of that stretch from April 19th to May 12th against South Alabama, Arkansas State, and Marshall because you're likely not winning a series up until maybe Georgia Southern. (laughs) You're just brighten them off. I – I'm disappointed again. I, I bought into the hype when they were going. I was like, maybe well, this year is different. But the whole – I don't understand how he gets in – how many years did he get extended? Two? Two. You know what the wild thing is? They're likely going to play at around a 500 level to finish out the season, probably be about four to five games below 500, meaning they'll finish this year 500. Yeah. That, that does sound about right. No, they will they extend yeah, okay, so two year extension, yeah. So he's through twenty twenty six. The new AD will have to deal with it in twenty twenty six. Or twenty twenty five. But if it's you like wanna, if you want a regional if you want a regional baseball team, you gotta you gotta you gotta move on. It's just frustrating. It's frustrating because they maybe had they some- turn the corner. Maybe they t- sorry. I'm just like getting all heated over here on this side of the screen. Maybe they turn the corner, and I hope they do. And like I, I don't want that to get lost in my persona, like this bit I'm doing, because I, I really do want this team to be great. Like I want baseball to be good. I want them to win. I, I want to apologize. I, I want them to be one of the top teams in the Sun Belt. They have the capabilities. They have the money behind it. They have the facilities. There's no reason that they should be a 500 team. I want to apologize. (laughs) But yeah, I I totally agree, right? They they shouldn't be this bad. I just think it's hilarious that it's like the take is like they're not going to get it done. And you're you're just rooting so hard for them to get it done. But your take has just been bulletproof for years. Ever since we started this five years ago in 2018, this has been my take. And I think the thing that's maybe most frustrating is kind of last year and then definitely this year, they're not terrible. They're just like they've been mediocre or average or slightly above average for what feels like way too long. Like you only, I don't know. No, I don't think any other program that's like slightly relevant at JMU, the coach would have. 10 years where they his could, extension is up. It'll be 10 years, 10 years without any regionals. And you, I mean, most coaches like 
it's not quite the same as like going to a bowl game because that's easier with the numbers and stuff. So I don't know the the best way to say it. But like if you had a men's like Matt Brady, right? If you had a men's basketball coach that goes however many years he went, seven, eight, ten, whatever, it was less than that. But you get one NCAA tournament that sort of kept him going, but there were 16. Like the whole thing is that you go to NCAA tournaments or region. Like that's that's success. And they just haven't had that. And a big reason for all of this is they're they're just their woes in conference play. It's not like yeah. like their pitching staff has just not held up in Sunbelt play, which was to be expected considering the Sunbelt is one of the top quote unquote mid major leagues in baseball. Out of all of the pitchers that they have used seven innings or more in conference play, none of them have an ERA better than 4.2. Their most used arm, Donovan Burke, 594 ERA. Jaden Kinsler, a f- he's been used 14 and two thirds, 798 ERA. Max Cool, 14 and two thirds, 614. And like your most used arms need to figure something out. Or, you, or as a coaching staff, you have to put them in better positions to succeed. And it just seems like they don't do that in conference play. It's just frustrating. I'll get off my my soapbox. I'll step down. And they've still got a chance because the RPI is sweet. So if you make a little run in the conference, yeah, standings, you're an at-large like, team. Yeah, you could make that push. It's just like do it. It just reminds me of the row conversation we would have each and every year, where they'd go on like a four-game winning streak or a two-game winning streak or three, whatever it was, like in the beginning of February, and we're like, okay. If they go 500 the rest of the way, right, right. they'll be they'll get the double buy. They'll get a buy, and then they win two more games over the next 15. And you're like, cool. At a certain Where point, it's like, you just you got to do it. You got to win. At this point in the season, we're looking at it. Okay, you're 16 and 12, three and six in conference play. Not a great start. Turn the corner, win some series, pick up two of three over the next four series, and you are sitting pretty and your RPI is going to look really good, and you're an at-large team. But can they do that? They haven't shown that they can over the previous eight years under Marlon Eikenberry. Yeah, I don't think it's unreasonable to want, for JMU baseball specifically, given how much the Valley cares, we've said this a million times, not unreasonable to want uh, like every five years to make a regional. Yeah, I don't think that's unreasonable at all. <laughs> And that might be low in terms of like goals. I I would want it more than that, but yeah, I'm greedy. Speaking of a team that has not only made a regional in the last decade, but they've made a women's college world series in the last few years. Softball, they sit at 21 and 13, five and two in Sunbelt play. They're coming off of a series sweep against Georgia State at home. Uh, what have you seen out of softball up to this point? And do you think they're a legit Sunbelt team? Hmm. Um, uh, I'm a little bit disappointed to be honest with you. Hater with the post women's college world series low more so than this team. Like this is a pretty young team. KK Mathis has been phenomenal. They've got some talent in the circle. Um, but I remember a few years back, like Jamie was head and shoulders above UVA and they were even better than tech, which has had a nice program. They played, UVA at home on March 27th and lost 12 to three. Like they just got bludgeoned and Virginia's make going to make a run in a regional. They're going to push to, to get into a regional, but it's just a little frustrating. Like they played at Maryland. Maryland's not very good. And they lost that one six to five. They had South Carolina on the ropes this year and and they squandered that one. They lost a couple of close ones to Charlotte that they could have won. <laughs> lost to Omaha and North Lake. There's just, a lot of games there where it feels like they could make that step. They could get back to where they were. It kind of just feels like maybe that, that season and that Mickey Dean run and, and the port a little bit too, might've been more of an outlier. And I hope I'm wrong there, but it, it definitely feels like they've taken a, a pretty obvious step back since those seasons in terms of even getting to regionals. They play a three-game series against a ranked Louisiana team on the road this weekend, which will be a huge test. We'll see if they can do anything there. Still optimistic. I like the team. The young players are good. But kind of similar to baseball where I'm feeling a little bit, I guess, a little bummed or disappointed that they were competing at such an incredible level 
and they seem like they're they're definitely not bad. They're above average. I think their RPI is pretty respectable. I just, I don't know. It feels like both those softball and baseball should be kind of regularly putting themselves in the mix to, to play in regionals. I'll push back a little bit on that just to maybe yeah. try and make you happy. Mm-hmm. I think softball is in a pretty good spot because they are so young where they really do have the potential to turn that corner early on in the season. You lose a couple of close ones to a rank a now ranked Charlotte team. You lose the close ones to South Carolina. You're losing these close games and you're a young team. So maybe the ball bounces your way in a different way. As the season goes on, your players really start to figure out the culture. They figure out the program and they start to grow and start to gel together more. It's a big, big series this weekend at Louisiana and Lafayette. If you can win a game, if you can win the series, that's massive because Louisiana has been just dog walking the Sun Belt the last decade. So this is a really big, really big uh, series this weekend. But I, I wouldn't say get too sad just yet. You lost Odyssey Alexander. There was some some terrible things that happened to this program, and I think they are they're in a good position to continue growth and continue to grow in a good Sun Belt league, which can put multiple teams in the NCAA tournament. I think that's an extremely fair take. I also like the the back half of their Sun Belt schedule. Feels like it has a lot of winnable series there outside of the Louisiana one. So yeah. I do think there's a decent chance they go on a pretty solid push here late, which would be cool. Uh, I think finishing top like three or four in the conference is is pretty reasonable. I, last year I forget exactly where they were, and they were picked to finish like fifth. So yeah. And then moving on over to Centera Park. I mean, we were really riding such a high like two months ago. With all of the sports, lacrosse, they've dropped two games since our, I think our last podcast where we talked about all sports. That wasn't an emergency pod. Uh, they're now ranked 12th, nine spot drop in the IWLCA top 25, fell 21 to 13 to now number 10 Johns Hopkins, fell 12 to 8 to number nine Virginia. We might have jumped the gun on the national championship contending stuff. And then before that fell 11 to eight to number nine, Maryland. Probably a little premature on our end, but they're still really good. They're, they're playing Richmond now and currently they're up 18 to 10. So they're going to win that game, get another win. They're really good. I don't know if, if national title is realistic based on some of the recent results against like other really top teams. I think maybe we put slightly too much stock into the North Carolina win to open the season. But still really, really good. I think they definitely belong sort of in that top 10 area. Yeah. What if I told you that uh, UNC was ranked second last week? Really? Yeah. I thought they slipped down a lot. They're 13th now. They're 14th now, but that's a change of 13 spots. The biggest movers in this week poll, this week's poll in terms of going down, um, Navy, Penn State. They fell 17 and 19 spots. And then in third was UNC at 13. Interesting. I will say all the losses happen on the road. So, um, you know, not the easiest there. They've got some, some winnable games coming up. I think they'll be competitive. They'll be battle tested going into postseason play. Yeah, I think for sure. I think they're, I think still a final four run is on the table. As the sirens go by Bennett Conlon, uh, anything else you got to add? I don't think so. I'll try to right. I'll try to cheer myself up on these diamond sports. That was this. Well, you don't have to on baseball, just softball. Yeah. Love to see softball steal a game. Also, I love that they get to play Louisiana. It's such a fun matchup. Yeah. That is the one of the perks in terms of non-revenue sports about this Sunbelt move. For Ben Conlin, I'm Jack Fitzpatrick. Thank you so much for tuning in. To the JMU Sports News Podcast presented by Bet Online. Be sure to follow us uh, wherever you're on social media, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, and then be sure to like, rate, subscribe, do whatever you got to do on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, wherever you're listening to the podcast, wherever you're listening to the stream. Be sure to follow along so you never miss a minute. We'll be back next week. Hopefully some, some things turn around and Bennett's more positive next week. That's all I can say. See ya.